So we got an exciting presentation for you on XR picture quality beyond display and optical hardware limitations. Uh, so I'd like to welcome uh, Eugene to the stage. Thanks. Hello, everybody. Uh, Carl did a really good job illustrating multiple problems, multiple hardware problems of head-mounted displays, so let's move on. <clears throat> there is a TED talk by a guy who spent an entire week wearing a virtual reality display. Can you imagine that? So when he finally took it off and got back to the real reality, his first thought was, what an amazing graphics. The entire idea of giving the users that inconvenience of wearing the displays on their heads is to immerse them visually in virtual or mixed reality, make them think and feel it's real. And so limited image quality and compromised visual experience do quite the opposite. They discern true reality from false picture and prevent the immersion. Oh, yeah, I should have clicked that. So uh, we have to admit that visual experience in VR, MR is far from being realistic, despite all the investments in the hardware design. So are we somehow fundamentally limited? I run a computational imaging company, and today I will be talking about those hardware limits and novel computational methods to overcome those. And let me start with a little teaser. So this picture was uh, taken in HP Reverb G2, one of the latest and greatest VR displays nowadays. Uh, running uh, Microsoft Flight Simulator. The circle shows the user's gaze area, so we're gonna take a closer look at that. And the next image was taken in the very same device, the same hardware, but with some software improvements. So this is an improved version. Let me see if you can, yeah, you can see the difference on this big screen. Pretty pronounced. So I'm showing that not to turn the presentation into a sales pitch, but to <laughs> illustrate the fact that even the best in the class hardware has a potential to deliver higher image quality, higher comparing to what the makers of that hardware could have achieved themselves. We don't believe they didn't want to. So why? Uh, let's look at a simple display pipeline where the image is projected by the display through the lens. And this lens is very physically constrained. It has to be thin, lightweight, desirably inexpensive, and so it's just impossible by the means of optical design alone to achieve high optical performance. The image comes to the eye aberrated and distorted. And therefore, in every head-mounted display pipeline, there is another indispensable component, image pre-processing, aimed at compensating those lens aberrations and distortions. It applies, for example, channel pre-scaling opposite to lateral chromatic aberrations, or geometry pre-warp opposite to the lens geometry distortions. And the idea is uh, that such pre-compensated picture being projected through the lens cancels out the lens aberrations, and the eye sees a picture that is almost correct. So the word almost is the key word here, because not everything can be corrected. I mentioned lateral chromatic aberrations. What about longitudinal chromatic aberrations? Monochromatic aberrations, astigmatism, coma, the aberrations causing less lens blur, killing the resolution, none of that gets corrected. And moreover, where the eye moves off the optical axis, the entire optical path in the system changes, and so do the aberrations, and nothing gets corrected at all. So there is a gap between what can be displayed and what can be transferred through the optics to the user's eye. And with the display specifications advancing, uh, we want a larger eye box, wider field of view, higher resolution at the end of the day. And the optical design constraints still being in place and holding back, this gap increases and turns into a roadblock on the way to achieving high picture quality. The thin, lightweight lens simply cannot be clear enough to transfer that increased resolution. It blurs those fine details diligently projected to our eye by high-resolution display. And moreover, even the best optical system 
doesn't work as designed when one of its optical elements moves off its place. In the camera manufacturing, the lens assembly tolerance is about three microns. Well, bad news, in every head-mounted display, there is an optical element that moves several thousand microns. That's the eye pupil. When it moves off the center, the blur and, and color fringing outburst. And at extremely wide angles, the picture gets completely ruined by fringing and blur. So simply increasing the display panel resolution doesn't work. A nice illustration of when it became apparent is Vive Pro, which had substantially high resolution uh, compared to the original Vive. But it appeared that the users couldn't see much of a difference. One of the first review, reviews of uh, Vive Pro says much of that extra resolution is useless. Enough with the words, let's measure. So we're gonna be measuring the resolution across the entire field of uh, gaze angles. And here is the map. So it's uh, MTF20, the value is 0 0.5 is the ideal value. It means 100% of the displayed resolution got transferred. And what we can see here is a small high resolution area in the center. And that's pretty much our VR experience. We always know that there is, there is a small good quality area in the center. What our VR experience doesn't tell us is that the measured visible resolution in that area is only about a half of what was displayed. And around that area, there's a much bigger area with about a quarter of resolution being transferred and Outside of that, it falls off to one-tenth and even lower. And this is pretty much the state of the art. So with those physically cons physical constraints, can we improve the component that is not physically constrained, the computational component? Can we switch from simple transformations like channel scaling and fixed geometry pre-warp to some sophisticated transformation, holistic transformation that addresses compensates all of the aberrations of the lens, including monochromatic aberration and higher order aberrations, and works at every eye position at all gaze directions. So uh, that girl in glasses, you know what she thinks when she looks at those complicated formulas? Two words, machine learning. Uh, we can display something and capture how it looks like, okay? So this is, by the way, a real example. You can see a drastic difference. Uh, so, we know what was displayed, we know what was seen. Can we reverse that? Can we calculate an image that we could have displayed so that when it got transferred through the lens, it would be seen as close as possible to the original one? Actually, can we come up with a transformation that for every source image would calculate such image with precompensation for all aberrations? So that, oh, sorry. So that when it gets projected, the user sees the picture that is as close as possible to what we want them to see. Uh, so we use those reference charts and captures and eye positions as a huge data set for neural network training. Uh, the data set collection and training are obviously time consuming and resource consuming processes, but those are done once per design. And then, uh, we have that neural network that constitutes a characterization of the entire scope of aberrations of optical system in the form of a transformation that is inverse to those aberrations. And this can be used in runtime. So the pre-processing algorithm gets the image data from the renderer, it gets eye position from the eye tracker, and it applies the proper inverse pre-aberration so that when the image gets projected, the entire gamut of uh, optical aberrations gets canceled out and the eye sees high resolution aberration free picture. Uh, let's get back to our measurements. So that was the device as is. And now we are adding this pre-correction. So what we can see is the good quality area got much bigger. But also the measured resolution in that area got much higher. It's now very close to the maximum possible to all display the resolution being transferred. And around that, at angles, obviously the resolution is lower, but still much higher as, uh, than in the device as is. 
So th that was the same display. We just somehow improved the optical performance. Practically, this algorithm did a job of a corrective lens system. Just lens system made not of glass or plastic, implemented as software. It has no size, it has no weight, and it's flexible. It can adjust on the fly to the moving eye. Uh, for that, we called it the digital lens. Uh, let's look at a few examples. So we already saw HP Reverb G2. This is just another scene, a closer look. The device as is with the digital lens. As is with the digital lens. And another scene, the device as is with the digital lens. You cannot read it, now you can. Drastic difference. Uh, let's move on to high resolution displays, Vario. Vario advertises so-called human eye resolution, which means that the pixel density is, uh, matches or exceeds the resolution capability of the eye. But can that high resolution be transferred through the optics? So we use this uh, architectural drawing with uh, fine details and high contrast as a test picture, uh, a closer look at the original, and now here's how it looks like in the display. Look at that blur. Look at that fringing. Human eye resolution was displayed, but got lost in transfer. And so, even a closer look, and now we are adding that new corrective software. With, without. Look how much more readable, how crisper the picture becomes. Even closer look, as is with the digital lens. Without, with. So now the human eye resolution got to the human eye. Another factor of uh, visual experience is so-called pupil swim, the geometry deformation when the eye moves relatively to the lens. And we will now be comparing the conventional fixed uh, geometry pre-warp to the dynamic machine learn based uh, correction. So uh, it's going to show bigger crops. So you can see the image at the right is wobbling much worse than the image at the left. The image at the left deformates a bit, but it, uh, it's much more steadier. And so this is not exactly image quality factor, but this is a visual experience. Uh, we naturally move our eyes. And if the geometry starts deforming when we do that, it doesn't feel, it doesn't look real. So we are out of immersion. It can also probably cause dizziness and nausea. So in a way, this is a software vaccine. Besides the display, uh, there is another limited piece of hardware in the head-mounted de devices, the pass-through camera. So <clears throat> those small, ca the, the, the pass-through camera used to capture the outside world and then show it to the user. So those small cameras are pretty good, largely thanks to the smartphone industry. Uh, they capture high quality pictures to be shown on large displays uh, and there is a lot of advanced ISP software developed for them. So is the camera technology already good enough for the pass-through use case? Well, it appears that in head-mounted displays there are new limitations and new requirements to be met. At high frame rates, those sensors output reduced resolution. For example, Pico 3 Neo pass-through camera outputs 640 by 480 pixels only. And that's not a picture to look at at a small smartphone screen at a narrow angle. This is for the entire field of view. Uh, a requirement, zero noise toleration. We used to see noise in pictures and videos captured by cameras. We can blame the capturing device. It was not so good, so the picture is noisy. But when I'm immersed in mixed reality, my eyes become the capturing devices. And if I see noise, something is wrong with my eyes. I don't want that to be true. I'm out of the immersion. And at the same time, at high frame rates, we have reduced, um, uh, reduced exposure time. So the image data is going to be naturally noisy, and we have to heavily filter out the noise, further, further uh, killing the details. So the demand for the software component here sounds like this. We need a software that delivers resolution higher than the camera can capture and the signal-to-noise ratio higher, higher than camera can capture. With the challenge comes a relief. 
again, with the, uh, in the form of eye tracker, which tells us where the user is looking at, where the fovea area is. And we know that the users notice and appreciate uh, high resolution only in fovea area, so we can limit our processing to that area only and hopefully be able to use more sophisticated uh, algorithms and still have them running fast enough to achieve real-time operation. The resolution improvement or super resolution method that we propose is multi-frame fusion plus deep blur. So through fusing the consecutive frames and registering them with sub-pixel precision, we are able to reconstruct the details that are smaller than a pixel. And at the same time, through the fusion, we are increasing signal-to-noise ratio. We are getting a lower noise of a bigger pixel. And then this data goes through neural network-based deep blur, which further reconstructs the details from under the lens blur. The neural network, in this case, uh, learns optical properties of the system. It is taught to reconstruct the details. Unlike the conventional nowadays AI super resolution approach where the neural network learns to guess objects or patterns and basically replace parts of the picture with something it learned from the data set. Uh, such approach inevitably leads to artifacts here and there. And again, say in smartphone photography, we can tolerate that in exchange for uh, better quality overall. But when I'm immersed and again, my eyes are the capturing devices, and I see artifacts. It means I'm hallucinating, and I don't want that to happen. Well, at least not all the time. So uh, let's take a look at a video showing uh, uh, capture through the standard ISP and the same camera with super resolution. So <clears throat> this is standard, turn to super resolution. Same hardware, again. Standard ISP, super resolution. More details, better user experience, more immersion. So to conclude the presentation, uh, using software to overcome hardware limits is, is a trend, is a huge trend nowadays. People do amazing things with that. We are proposing a holistic uh, ISP, set of ISP techniques for the head-mounted displays that un unleash the potential of the hardware and allow to get us beyond the hardware limits. It increases about two times the visible resolution, it doubles the captured resolution, it enlarges the eye box, it cleans false color fringing, and it adds no size and no weight to the device. We are running our demo here at the booth 821. Uh, don't miss your chance, go check it out. Uh, thank you for your attention, and if there are any questions, very welcome. <laughs>